this lovely warm day and a very warm welcome, Mike, to you. It's uh, a pleasure to have you back with us. So may God bless you richly. Right, the notices then for the coming week. This evening at six o'clock, Mike will be with us again. And, oh, Lady Circle, welcome back tomorrow at 2.30. Bible study on Tuesday 7.15, continuing with the study on Elijah. We had a lovely time last week and I would um, encourage anyone who, uh, who can, who is able to come, to come. Very, very good indeed. And prayer meeting on Wednesday 7.15, again, everyone is welcome to that. Forget me not on Wednesday and Thursday, as usual. And on Thursday at 5, we have a Deacons and Trustees meeting in the um, meeting room here. Um, ladies Bible study on Friday at 2, and the uh, speaker will be Ruth Fry. And we continue uh, supporting the food bank. It is building up again, so um, if you can, just remember that we are still supporting and the need is very great there. So um, all donations would be welcome. And again, the Romanian Aid Foundation supporting Ukraine and, as usual, the things that are accepted and the things that we can't give. Um, but let's continue supporting that very worthy cause. <clears throat> on fellowship news let's continue holding dear Victor up in prayer he's not very good at all and June too who is caring for him and uh, I have some other names here Margaret Howells for those of you who don't know she usually sits over this side she's had a very very bad fall and they think that she's broken her hands. So we hope Margaret has been prayer. And Betty Wheeler hasn't been here for some time. She also sits over this side. She's broken her hip. Sorry? She's broken her hip. She has, she's broken her hip, yes. And we continue holding little Malia. I don't know the latest uh, about Mali, but um, she's got we, another operation. She's still in Bristol. She's still in Bristol. They're doing tests and scans on her every day. And they found out that there's something wrong with the aorta valve. And they're going to have to do something about that. And they're in touch with Great Ormond Street. Right. So they're doing tests on her every day. And they're in touch with Great Ormond Street. So, not very good news. So let's hope this little one up in prayer. And Dudley, of course, we continue praying for Dudley. Um, sorry, anyone else that we should be remembering? Who? Keith. Oh, oh, Keith, yeah. Keith isn't too good at the moment. He hasn't been very, very great recently, and he's not well today, so we are home with Keith. And is that it, anyone? Anne Woodward has had shingles. She's been in hospital, but I understand she's home now. So, you know, quite a few people, and let's, let's remember them. And a lady who was with us this, this morning, dear Ruth Hayden, had a nasty fall last night. No, not last night, was it the night before? Fell out of bed and hurt herself very badly, and she's here today. So, Thank you. I think that's all. Thank you very much. There's a couple of people just coming upstairs.
and that your truth would guide us. We ask that your Holy Spirit would fill this place and empower us to live for you. Heavenly Father, we come before you with grateful hearts and spirits. We thank you for the gift of life, for the breath in our lungs, for the grace that sustains us. We thank you for calling us to be your children, for allowing us to be your friends and your co-workers in this kingdom. We thank you for inviting us to worship you here this morning. Help us to lift our eyes up to you, the author and perfecter of our faith. Help us to sing your praises with passion and sincerity. Help us to listen to your word with reverence and obedience. Help us to pray with faith and humility for everything that's on our hearts. And we ask this in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. <coughs> okay, now to your first chance to sing with passion. Um, we're going to do our first hymn, which is, All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name.
So that's a lovely hymn written in the, the late um, 18th century. <coughs> I have to confess that when I was coming here this morning, I quite often, if I'm going to a service, I'll play Christian music in the car and sort of lift my spirits. But <coughs> because of my generation, it tends to be verging on heavy metal <laughs> Christian music with uh, a four minute guitar solos in the middle of it. Um, I, I love all Christian music. Okay, we're going to have the reading. It's from the Gospel of, of Mark, chapter 10, verses 35 to 45. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him. Teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. And what do you want me to do for you, he asked. They replied, let one of us sit at your right and the other at your left in your glory. You don't know what you're asking, Jesus said. Can you drink the cup I drink or be baptised with the baptism I am baptised with? We can, they answered. Jesus said to them, you will drink the cup I drink and be baptised with the baptism I am baptised with. But to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. Those places belong to those for whom they've been prepared. And when the other ten heard about this, they became indignant with James and John. Jesus called them together and said, You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must become a servant, and whoever wants to be first must become the slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for men. Amen. say a few words of uh, prayer before we have the Lord's Prayer. <clears throat> and we pray for the well-being and success of, of our children and, and grandchildren uh, who just started back at school, they just had their first week. As they learn so much else, we pray that they also learn about you. We pray for all peoples both at home and abroad, who are suffering. Who are suffering from poverty, from war, from hunger, from homelessness, from lack of medical facilities, from people trafficking, and other forms of exploitation. We pray for those, again, around the world at the moment, who are facing terrible floods or terrible fires. And we pray for the emergency services that they go to try and help those people in their need. We pray for those who are sick in our community. We don't know the names of many people in this fellowship who are ill at the moment. So let's pause for a couple of minutes and, and just sit silently and pray for those who are on our own hearts. and heal, if it's your wish, all those who are sick in mind or body or spirit. Give strength and skill to the doctors and nurses and care workers and the chaplains who are looking after those who are sick. Merciful God, accept our prayers, which we raise in the name of your Son, Jesus. Shall we say the Lord's Prayer together? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. 
sing a second hymn now. O oh, love that will not let me go. leadership 
There's an entire book section. There'll be a whole section that's all about leadership and succeeding in, in various fields. And you can, you can poke about, but I defy you to find a section on servanthood, on how to be a good servant. The adverts we watch on TV tell us you're worth it. They don't ask you if you're worthy. It's a very, very different mindset in the world that we live in today. And so it's, it's very difficult to live up to that, um, that request by Jesus to be a servant because it's totally countercultural. You're being asked to behave in a way that's the opposite of the way that society wants you to behave or expects you to behave or suggests that it will respect you if you behave like that. But that is the way of Jesus. You know, whatever we might think about how being a servant at some point is beneath our dignity, you know, because of the position we hold or the title we have, the person who asked to do it was God. He gave up his deity to come down on earth and serve us. He gave up absolute power, absolute strength, absolute vision, absolute everything to come down and be a human being just like us. Now we remember that in a few months' time at Christmas. Emmanuel, God with us. So if God could come from that high to this low, he's not asking quite so much of us to put our, um, uh, our egos aside every now and then to serve others. And as we saw in that passage, Jesus was prepared to, to do this to the ultimate extent. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. That uh, request for, for God's people to be servants is actually scattered all the way through the scriptures. It's not something that pops up one or two times in the New Testament. It's there over and over again in the New Testament, but it's also uh, over and over again in the Old Testament as well. And those passages in Scripture show that God respects those who have a servant heart. He blesses them, but he also respects them. And he's not quite so respectful of people who clearly don't have a servant heart. In the letter by James, the, the human brother of Jesus, he says, God goes against the willful proud. God gives grace to the willing humble. So when, when we do serve, when we put aside our ego, our ego is to serve other people, it's easy to think, well, you know, we're not being noticed. But God notices. The person who matters notices. It doesn't matter if nobody else sees what you're doing. God will see what you're doing. And that's what matters, that you're helping one of God's children and that God will see you doing it. You don't need an audience. And if you're seeking an audience, you don't have the kind of harm that God wants. It's been said that we've been saved to serve. And there's a lot of truth in that. So we need to swim against the tide of our culture and have the heart of a servant. So what does that mean? You know, when Jesus asked to have a servant heart, what does he mean by that? Ooh. What does it mean to be a servant <coughs> in those terms? Well, first of all, we have to have the attitude of a servant. And that's obviously the most difficult thing to adopt in, in the society we live in. <clears throat> and that means consciously trying to put the needs of others before your own needs. In his letter to the people in Philippi, Paul said, Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests 
of others. The underlying motivation for being a servant is love. That's why Jesus came and served on earth, out of love, out of God's love for us. And that's why he was willing to die, because he loves us. And that's why we should serve one another, because we're serving the people that God loves. <coughs> uh, in another one of his letters to the Galatians, Paul said, Through love serve one another, for all the law is fulfilled in one word. Love. Even in this, you shall love your neighbour as yourself. The second requirement of, of having a servant heart is to be humble. And again, that's a lot easier said than done. But it means laying down our will in order to serve God's will. To put ourselves in a position of humble obedience. If you read the Gospels, you can see that that's exactly what Jesus does. He lives in a special kind of mental and emotional, spiritual place all the time where he's in deep connection with God. And he's constantly asking, what do you want, Father? And then seeking to, to do that. And that's what we have to do. We have to think like that. Humble people fear the Lord. They look upwards. They look up to God. Proud people look down. They look down on others. Humble people listen. They listen to the voice of God for guidance, including when God chooses to speak to us through the voice of another person. Sometimes people are saying things to you that's a message that God wants you to hear. Not just in a sermon, in a conversation in the checkout queue at a at Tesco's or anywhere else, there could be a moment where somebody says something to you because God wanted to hear, wanted you to hear that at that moment. So you need to be willing to listen. Humble people encourage others. They take joy in seeing other people being successful. Proud people aren't like that. They resent the success of others. They feel threatened when other people are successful. Many of them will discourage other people from being successful. But somebody with a Jesus-like servant heart will always want to encourage people, even to encourage them to be better than they are. You know, it's one of the things about being a teacher that you always dream that you get to teach the person who's going to go on and be a far greater uh, um, professor or whatever than you are. You know, because it's not just about you, it, it's, it's the joy of seeing that seed growing into something amazing. In our culture, it's hard to be humble. We're taught to be ruthless. You know, we're taught to, to do what it takes to win, even if that means using railroads or, or something worse. So we might think, well, if we had the heart of a servant, and we live our lives with a servant heart, people will think less of us. <laughs> He's a mug, you know, doing, doing this way when he could have done that and then got to the top and then picked a play for Wales or elected a parliament, whatever it might be. But is that really the way we think? You know, when we think of people that, that we really do think have a servant heart, do we feel content for them? Do we really think of but it was a mug. Um, you know, people you've worked with, maybe, who you thought, you know, the way they do things, the way they commit themselves to their job, their perfectionism, their willingness to help you know, new people in the job who don't know how to do it, their willingness to maybe help somebody who's struggling a bit and might get sacked if you can't get a bit better. Usually, those are people you respect. You don't feel contempt for them. If I ask you, Name the person in your life who you think, out of all the people you've known, had the most servant-like heart. What would you say? Not a trick question. Anybody? 
I think, sorry? Exactly. I think 99% of people, if they're asked that question, will say their mother. Because a lot of us have been blessed to have a mother who embodies the servant heart. They spend their whole lives putting their children first, ahead of them, putting their husband first, ahead of them. Not because it's, it's expected of them, but because they, they just have this love for these people and they want to pour it out, and that's what they do. And if I ask you a follow-up question, oh yes, because you're not you, well, have a certain heart, did you think less of her? Of course not. Absolutely the opposite. You know, usually you almost worship your mother, you know, in a good sense. Um, because she's such a wonderful person, because she does have a certain heart. In reality, although society says, you know, we should look down on people who have this kind of commitment to service, I don't think we do deep down. When we actually meet somebody like that, we respect them. We think, fuck yeah, I wish I could be like that. I wish I had that kind of inner fire and in, in that inner spirit. Servanthood is also about attitude, not just about action. Obviously it's about action, about doing things. But you've got to have the right attitude. I was in a hospital um, um, a while ago and uh, Kath and I had to get a lady downstairs from her bedroom to take to the hospital. <coughs> and there was another person there and uh, it took us nearly half an hour to get her down the stairs because she could only do tiny pigeon steps. And she was so weak we had to hold her up and, and I had to place her feet each time. And there was another person there, 28 year old man, who just watched us do this all the way. So we got to get to the bottom of the stairs and we put her in a wheelchair and we take her to the car. And again, you know, it's a dead weight effort getting her out of the car into the car and drive to the hospital. Same thing, get her out of the car into the wheelchair. We go into the hospital doors and this person says, oh, let me help. And starts pushing the wheelchair past all these attractive young nurses and, and doctors and people. And it's obvious they're doing it because, not because they wanted the help, otherwise they would have done it a lot earlier. They want to be seen helping. They want to think other people think, oh, what a nice man. Look at him, pushing that lady in the wheelchair. You don't get a blessing for that, okay? It's always good to help people. But if your reason for helping them is to puff yourself up, that's not a, self, uh, a servant heart. Not the way Jesus understands it. There's a story told in chapter 13 of John's Gospel, which I'm sure you're all very familiar with. It's Jesus and the disciples have gone to Jerusalem for the Passover feast. And they're meeting in an upstairs room to share the Passover meal. But whoever booked the room on their behalf has forgotten to hire somebody to wash the people's feet as they go in the door. This is a tradition in Israel, you know, when you had a feast or anything, or, or even if a visitor came to your house, you would wash, well, you wouldn't wash their feet, you would have a servant wash their feet. Um, and nobody had done this. And it's very noticeable that when, the, when everyone realizes, oh, there's nothing to do with this, none of the disciples say, don't worry, I'll do it. No sweat. Uh, they just start arguing with themselves again about who's, who's the best. So Jesus decides to use this as a lesson. So he strips off down to his underclothes, basically, just to a garment around his waist. And then he washes the feet of the disciples. He not only acts the part of, this, of a servant, he makes himself look like a servant. And he's trying to send a message to the disciples. It's the same one that he told James and John and the others. If you want to be one of God's people, you must become a servant. And no position that you hold means that that's beneath you. The Son of God can do this and wash the dirty feet of his disciples. And so can you. Of course, it's, it's not a story, it's not a message that you must go out and wash feet every chance you get. It's about serving. It just happened to be washing feet in that example. Um, I don't have time to say this, but those of us who've been at Parkland Church might remember one day when there was a visiting uh, preacher 
from Zach's place. And he was telling us about the work that, that they did at Zach's place. Um, particularly at one point during his sermon, uh, he mentioned this evening where they, they come together for a prayer. And these are all people who were sort of homeless and unemployed and nothing. But they're meeting to, to pray together and to read the Bible together. And this woman turned up. And, and they, they all knew her, they, they encountered her before, but she was really disruptive. She stunk to high heaven. She clearly hadn't washed for about 30 years. She was lying drunk and foul mouthed with it and really loud and abusive. And they asked her a few times to just calm down and sit quietly, but they were getting nowhere. This woman was just shouting her head off and swearing at people. And um, the, the sort of leadership team at um, Sat's place just didn't know what to do. You know, they weren't in the business of throwing people out. <laughs> that wasn't the way of Jesus. They didn't want to do that. You know, this is somebody who'd come there for a reason. And one of them sort of disappeared for a minute, and he came back out, and he had a basin with warm water and a rag, and that's what he did. He took with her stinking uh, socks, and he washed her feet. And reduced everyone in the room to complete tears. The woman calmed down completely. And the, the rest of the meeting went on as you would want it to. She actually died of drug poisoning about two weeks later. But everyone in that place hoped that in those two weeks she'd found God. So, you know, that there, there was a, a point where somebody actually did it literally, um, what Jesus did. Uh, and it was a, a miraculous thing then. But normally, it doesn't mean you know, literally to wash feet, it means literally to serve others in some way. And one of the things you notice in that episode, maybe we don't pick up on it all the time, is Jesus washes the feet of all the disciples. You know, we read that line and we think, yeah, you know, they're the disciples, he washes their feet. But think about it. He doesn't just wash the feet of John, you know, the beloved disciple, at least according to the Gospel of John, so not entirely in Protestant. And who's John? Well, he's one of John and James, who we just read in the passage, has got a bit of an ego, and thinks he and his brother should be top dogs in the disciples, you know, sitting at God's side. He's not flawless. Now, who else's feet is Jesus washing that night? Peter, who in a few hours' time is going to deny him three times. He washes the feet of Thomas, who in a few days will just not believe that Jesus has come back from the dead. And most amazingly of all, he washes the feet of Judas, who's about to betray him. So even knowing all that about these people, even knowing they're the usual flawed rubbish that we all are, he loves them and washes their feet. Even Judas, he gives one last chance to turn it around, you know, shows him how much he loves him. And again, that's the message. When Jesus says you need to be a servant, it doesn't mean you choose your moments. You know, we can all serve our best friends and our partners and uh, family members and people, you know, people we really like. They're easy to serve. It's not so easy to serve the people we don't like. People that we know would never do the same for us or anybody else that probably won't say thank you. But that's the message Jesus is sending there. You're expected to be a servant, and that means serving God's children. And you don't get to choose who they are. They're just people in need. They may be people you like, they may be people you dislike. But if you have the chance to serve them, then you serve them. So if you're going to be a servant, you've got to be involved with people. You know, in order to meet people's needs, you've got to know what those needs are. You know, it's one of the reasons you know, Janet reads those things at the start of the service, so we're aware of who's sick, who needs our prayers, who might like a visit from us, um, who can't cook for themselves at the moment so we could bring them around a meal, or sit by them and read a book or something like that. You need to know people in order to meet their needs. Again, that's a reason why Jesus comes down to earth. He comes down in order to identify us, identify with us, to be with us, 
to be one of us so that he knows exactly what we feel. He knows exactly what we're going through every time. And when we're going through terrible times, Jesus has been there. He knows your feelings, understands them, and loves you knowing your feelings. Uh, and we need to do the same. You know, we need to get involved at church. We need to know our fellow workers to some extent. Not, not intruding on their lives, but at least, you know, being able to pick up on the clues when they're asking for help. Um, and, and being able to step forward and do that. When I was a kid, they used to talk about sins of commission and sins of omission. Sins of commission were things when you did something wrong that you know you shouldn't have done. A sin of omission was when you had the opportunity to do something right and you chose not to do it. It was also sin of sin. It was very hard not to sin when I was a kid. Of course, it got even easier when I was old. I don't know we won't talk about that. Um, the Apostle James, again in, in his letter, said, As it is, you are full of your grandiose selves. All such halting self-importance is sinful. If you know the right thing to do and don't do it, for you that is sin. So we need to remind ourselves that our life is not just about others. Um, we should be willing to help others when they need help. We should be willing not just to wait to be asked to do things, but to look for opportunities to serve. There are always lots of them. We should be selfless, we should be humble, and we should be present for God. Able to hear God when he speaks and says, Mike, I need you to help this person. And when he asks, obviously, we need to do it. And we need to do it with the other aspect of the human heart, which is that it's absolutely um, true. There's, there's nothing fake about it. You know, when Jesus did everything he did on this earth, None of it was an act. He wasn't faking any of this stuff. This was who he was. This was who God is. And we need to try and be the same. You know, we do it because it's the right thing to do. We do it because it's a way of showing our love for others. We do it because it's what God wants to do. We don't do it grudgingly. And we don't do it to impress other people. So having a servant heart, being able to go through life like this, would change us. And I, I suspect many of you, you know, already fit that description, and not sort of accusing people, just encouraging people. Um, but it does change you. It changes the kind of person you are, if you're somebody always looking to try and help anyone who might need your help. But that's what we're supposed to do. That's what Jesus asks us to do. That's what the prophets ask us to do. That's what the Psalms ask us to do. To serve others. Become a servant. So the question always is, when you wake up in the morning, who can I serve today? Amen. Amen. Okay, we'll have another hymn. The third hymn, which is How Deep the Father's Love
Loving God, we thank you for hearing our prayers, for feeding us with your word, and for encouraging us in our meeting together this morning. We rejoice in your greatness and in your power. Help us through your Holy Spirit to honour you in our thoughts, in our words, and in our actions, and to serve you in every aspect of our lives. Lord, as we leave today, we ask that you bless us and use us to love and serve you and all people. In the power of your Spirit and in the name of your wonderful Son, Jesus. Amen. Amen.